We're taking this boat from Texas to Florida to Georgia, putting it in situations it was definitely not designed to handle. What was that? With 10 of the most interesting anglers we know. Yeah, it's set it. Yeah! Oh, dude, that is really, really, really fun, man. Just in hand. They'll each get one day to make whatever modifications they want. One boat, five fisheries, 10 anglers, 2,500 miles, unlimited bad ideas. This is Das Boat. After a few days in Austin, Texas, Das boat hit the highway for a drive. She headed east, crossed four state lines, and then bent south till she reached one of my favorite places, Sanibel Island, Florida. A small island off the west coast of Florida, Sanibel has long been one of my top fishing destinations in the lower 48. In this episode, Das Boat teams up with Ed Anderson and Meat Eater's very own and beloved Ryan Callahan. Cal's the director of conservation at Meat Eater and a genuine savant when it comes to all things outdoors. Cal's buddy Ed is an artist who's made his name painting iconic wildlife. So why these two and why here? I'd like to say it's because Sanibel fishing is red hot right now, but unfortunately it's a bit more complicated. A huge fish kill last year decimated populations all over this area. But conditions have improved, and we've heard that fish are moving back in. Ed has fished Sanibel since he was a kid, so Cal headed down there to meet up with him and check on the status of the recovery. But before they can assess the fishery, Cal and Ed need to get acquainted with Das Boat. The boys have just one day to make her effective and seaworthy for the mission. Huh. That's cute. <laughs> Got the grill on the side, we can make some lunch. Yeah. <laughs> this, yeah. All right. Where'd they get this in a backyard somewhere? Like it. In order to fish shallow water, the guys want to mount a polling platform on the stern and build a casting deck to make fishing from the bow more stable and comfortable. That raised deck will also help the guys avoid tangling their lines on Das Boat's proliferation of sharp metal objects. Yeah, my contribution is gonna be sweat equity. <laughs> Cal's responsible for the platform and the deck, while Ed is gonna tune up the aesthetic qualities of Das Boat. I mean, you don't want me doing real work, dude. dude these delicate hands, as you said. All right, I'm gonna track down some tools. Yeah, this thing is, for better or worse, done. Right. Almost. Pretty sturdy. Yeah. Uh, I'll need a hand uh, fabbing up our casting deck, yeah. casting platform. Yeah, definitely. Went out and did a little creative scavenging here on the island. And apparently there's a hotel that was doing some renovations, throwing out perfectly good carpet like this. This carpet and I are one at this point. <laughs> Snug that in there. You know, you know what we get to call this? What's that? Poop deck. Because <laughs> it, it's got poop on I, it. I got it. Yeah. I got it. Did you get some in your mustache while you're working on it? Save it for the whole trip? 
Oh, I can smell it. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Somebody get the bleach. Are they, they, they running to get the bleach for this thing? Yeah, we're getting bleach. All right, yes. good. Well, job well done, man. Yeah, this man. This thing's looking sweet. So excited to see these guys on the water. <laughs> I think you're going to like it. We're going to get back on the back side of the refuge here, get in some skinny stuff, and it's, uh, it's a pretty special place. The Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge is a mangrove maze of tidal cuts, creeks, and lakes. This refuge was named for J. Norwood Darling, a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist instrumental in wildlife conservation during the early 1900s. His namesake refuge on Sanibel Island draws more than a million visitors each year, including scads of bird watchers and anglers. Ed was appointed as the refuge's artist in residence this year, perpetuating Ding's legacy by celebrating wildlife in the places that inspire him. Despite the reports they've gotten about low fish numbers, Cal and Ed are looking forward to taking Das boat into the refuge and hopeful about hooking at least a few of this area's famously difficult fish. I think snook are one of my favorite fish to catch. They, they blow up hard and then they run back as fast as they can to the, something that's going to cut your line immediately. Plus, you might get a jump in there if you're lucky. Tarpon are just rad, creepy aliens that are from some other land. Visual part of, of this kind of fishing is what's what I think is, is pretty cool. I like snook and tarpon because they're just generally frustrating. When you are fishing for super, super picky fish, they do leave a lasting memory. But before the boys can make some of those lasting memories, they'll have to find a couple of fish. Hi, buddy. Good to see you. How you doing? Good. Sure Thank you for picking me up at my out. home. <laughs> and conventional tackle? Got some conventional tackle, some fly rods. While the tide's still a little bit low, let's go see if we can find some snook cruising around on these flats. OK. Um, I don't think we'll see any redfish tails, but probably find some stuff busting bait. OK. See what's, uh, see what's going on. We'll bang the mangroves once the, the tide gets a little high. And then once the tide starts going out, let's uh, throw, some, throw that bigger rod with some tarpon. Is that some... the name of your band? What's that? Banging mangroves? Banging mangroves. <laughs> That's pretty good. I think what we'll do is we'll go, we'll go work back on the back side of this, this island right here. So we'll go around the corner and get back behind the Wolford Keys. OK. And then we'll go, as the tide keeps rising, we'll go up on the half moon at, uh, around Tarpon Bay on the back side of the refuge. And then we'll try to sneak into Ding Darling. So I am really very, like, very excited to learn how to pull okay. a little bit. Cool. This is a perfect day and a perfect boat to learn it, honestly. It's light. I just like new stuff, you know? Controlling the boat like a pro. Within the first few minutes, Cal and Ed spot a disturbance that looks like feeding fish, a fortuitous portent that the effects of last year's red tide have started to abate. Try one o'clock. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Got it. Brilliant work, my friend. Brilliant work. I mean, it was pulling more than anything. I believe that this is what we refer to as a poor man's tarpon. Oh, we got a ladyfish? Ladyfish, also known as skipjack, aren't what you'd call a target species. In fact, I'd call them bait. But a fish is a fish, and early success brings hope. Good call, guide. Teamwork, man. Oh, big shark. Should probably cut down on the 
but that's a big fucking shark. Good hey boy, Cal. Ladyfish! The scientific name for ladyfish, Elopsaurus, loosely translates to serpent reptile. They're not the fish the guys are after, but they're a good sign that this area might not be as desolate as we feared. I think we need to paint over these tarpon on the front, and get a ladyfish instead. As the tide comes in, Ed and Cal make their way into the Ding Darling Refuge, hoping to find some snook hiding under the mangroves. Ding Darling was, he was an artist. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist. Worked, you know, the, the I believe it was FDR got him in, and he created the biological survey, which became the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it was just out of appreciation for things he could draw. He was pushing a conservation angle that was so before his time. I mean, essentially, he created the duck stamp competition. So, I mean, he, he basically created how we think nationally about, about conserving our wildlife. After those two ladyfish first thing in the morning, the bite shuts off. And as the hours pile up, the changes in the fishery around the refuge become more apparent. As the tide, air temperature, and cast count all rise, Ed and Cal's energy and enthusiasm starts to drop a little bit. So the boys seek out some shade in the refuge and take a break. You know, when I used to come down here, it used to be like a given that I could grab my fly rod and a popper yep. and just pitch around and pick up sea trout and ladyfish. And I've had at least three people tell me, like, don't even bother with sea trout. Yeah. And if you look at the regulations now, it used to be a slot limit when yep. I was down here. Yep. And now it's, you can't keep any. Yeah, but I mean, that's all related to the, the red tide that happened last winter. Um, just, it, it, was, it was a disaster here. It killed tons and tons of fish, manatees, sharks, everything, dolphins, and, yeah, they basically shut down the, the game fishing and uh, trying to help these populations recover, so. But this this last red tide isn't like, because uh, red tide's a, a natural occurrence, but this last one was like the queen mother of red tide. The people who know things more than I say that it was exacerbated by the, uh, the discharges from the Caloosahatchee coming out of Lake Okeechobee. Um, and, and yeah, it really, uh, it, it destroyed this place for a while. The entire economy on these islands, these barrier islands, is, is based on tourism, fishing, beach shelling, you know, and, and you could literally could smell the air for that long and that it was bad. I mean, being down here at Ding Darling, artist in residence, is this a conversation that, that comes up? This is one of the, the big pertinent conservation conversations in the country right now, especially me as a guy who's working here with Ding Darling which was the epicenter of the, the red tide, it ties right into all those Florida water issues. If, if I'm not having those conversations, I'm probably doing it wrong. To understand Ding Darling and his work, you have to realize that he approached wildlife conservation from the depths of despair. Jay, or Ding as he was called, penned scathing cartoons lamenting the decline in wildlife populations in his lifetime. In the early 1900s, American wildlife was at an all-time low. Game species we now think of as abundant, even overabundant, like deer and turkey, were at risk of vanishing. Darling and others understood that the key to saving wildlife was, in part, to set aside places where nature could do her work undisturbed. Populations might collapse, but with viable habitat, they could rebound. That knowledge, implemented through refuges and other protected areas, helped resurrect many of our game species over the past century. But the future of our fisheries remains uncertain, especially in Florida. Let's uh, call it a day. Go we'll find a beer and a shrimp. Beer and a shrimp. Um, early squirrely tomorrow, maybe? Yeah, early squirrely. We need to get out here before all this water comes in. For Cal and Ed, just the possibility of finding and perhaps connecting with a tarpon or snook keeps them enthusiastic about the potential of another long day. And the boys are up early the next morning, 
hoping that the incoming tide will bring a few fish. But day two starts out even slower than the one before. Despite the favorable tide, some nice morning cloud cover, and a whole lot of casting to good looking water, the snook, tarpon, sea trout, and redfish they've been trying to conjure are nowhere to be found. Even after the sun passes its zenith and the tide changes from low to high and to slack, Cal and Ed keep grinding it out. They've got one last tide change and one last opportunity for this refuge to show its potential to allow these fish to return and repopulate. These tide swings, it kind of keys the whole thing up. Conditions are looking good. All of a sudden, fish got to eat. Well, we saw that one up here, so we'll see if you can think about it. Good job, Cal. What would you use a net for? Come on. There, I got it. Got In the it? past, one average size sea trout and two days of fishing around here would have felt like total like failure. Cowardly. But this fish on this day represents hope and the capacity of this ecosystem to rebound. One year ago, the water here would have killed this fish, but increased awareness, changes to Florida's water management system, and some fortunate weather have prevented a recurrence of last year's catastrophic red tide. You'd have to think that Ding Darling would be pleased, really, both in terms of wildlife habitat and in terms of artists like Ed, who continue to inspire folks to get out in the field or on the water and develop meaningful relationships with fish, animals, and wild places. Catching fish is great. Knowing that there are fish out there is even greater. Well, Kel, what do you think? I think that was a solid run, man. Let's get out of the sun. Go we'll grab a beer, call her a trip. Yeah. Hard to have a bad day on the water. Hell yeah. Hey, fish were caught. Oh yeah. Well, we're excellent anglers, so. I know. It's not our fault, obviously. Yeah. Difficult as conditions have been, this fishery is recovering. The long-term success of that recovery hinges on outdoorsmen and women continuing to demand that Florida manage its water wisely. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to chop up a few things here and talk about the fact that, you know, Ed and I are really phenomenal anglers. And that is the grouper uh, ceviche. Cilantro, more red onion. I'm going to have you mix that up with the grouper. And that fish is like where you want it to be. Pretty freaking good, dude. If you can't catch it, at least it's convenient. Right? right? Yeah. There's somebody around here who can. Yeah. <laughs> Fishermen are insatiable optimists, and we know the number of fish caught isn't the only measure of a fishing trip. You were talking about like this refuge system. You bring up the fact that like 90% of the visitors see 10% of the park or 10% of the refuge. Yeah, if that. If that. This boat is gonna see more country than 90% of the people out there. I think it's on an adventure. It'd be, it'd be fun to ride it all the way through. Absolutely, yeah, I'm dying. So who does who does it go to next, Cal? Uh, it goes to Oliver Nye and April Vokey, and they're gonna go up and fish Lake Okeechobee. Well, they better For a uh, big bass. Make sure they get the keys, man. Oh. That's an important thing to pass along. Yeah. Yes. And then whatever that string of things is. Well, thanks a bunch, man. I really appreciate it. It's that so was great. much fun. Yeah. So much fun. Let's do it again. Sometimes success means sharing a campfire with good people who share your positive outlook and appreciate really bad singing. Sweet Caroline.
On the next episode, Das Boat heads all the way up the Caloosahatchee River to its headwaters at Lake Okeechobee, where April Volke and Oliver Nye will fish for largemouth bass. Check it out. Uh, yeah. Oh, come on! Thanks for tuning in. I hope you like what you saw. Like us, leave a comment, and subscribe so that you do not miss future episodes.